it is now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. Michael Guerin Hospital in Beaches East York has consistently gone above and beyond in keeping us safe and cared for during the COVID-19 pandemic. They set up mobile testing clinics in communities where it was hard for COVID-19 patients to isolate, did everything they possibly could to keep people <clears throat> excuse me, alive in the ICU, and were flexible <clears throat> excuse me, and imaginative as they got jabs in as many arms as possible in ways that worked for everyone. Dr. Michael Warner, sorry, <clears throat> Michael Guerin's Director of Critical Care, made time to publicly educate everyone on the impact of every wave of COVID on hospitals and patients and to let us know what public policy they need so that they could do their jobs. Hospitals like Michael Guerin have saved thousands upon thousands of lives. Healthcare workers and administrators are exhausted and many are suffering from burnout. And after all that sacrifice, instead of showing that he has their backs, the Premier has sided with a tiny minority of anti-vaxxers and is allowing unvaccinated healthcare workers to endanger their colleagues and vulnerable patients alike, contrary to the advice of doctors, nurses and the science table. We are now in a world in which the Premier can have pops with his buddies inside a bar where you have to be double vaxxed, but unvaccinated vaccinated healthcare workers can be at the bedside of frail cancer patients. How does this make any sense? It was, as Dr. Warner tweeted, an indefensible decision. The government needs to reverse course and quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. I recognize the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook. Speaker, in just a few short weeks, Canadian Football League fans from across the country will arrive in my hometown of Hamilton for the 108th Grey Cup. The largest sporting event in Canada will be held December 12 at Tim Hortons Field to a packed stadium of 24,000 fully vaccinated football fans. The City of Hamilton has been getting ready for the celebration for years. While some of the larger Grey Cup events have been cancelled or scaled back this year, the hospitality sector can't wait to welcome visitors to the city's many world-class restaurants and bars. Hamilton has a football tradition that is second to none. 2021 will mark the 11th time that Hamilton has hosted the Grey Cup. The first time was way back in 1910. But, Speaker, it's been 25 years since our city hosted the Grey Cup. And this year, the festivities will be even more meaningful because the city is also celebrating its 175th birthday. Mm. As the pandemic restrictions are gradually lifted, people are ready to celebrate like never before. The championship game and the celebrations around it are exciting. And Speaker, Hamilton will get to do it all over again in another two years when we host Grey Cup 2023. All right. Thank you, member statements. The member from York, Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak to the alarmingly high cost of mandatory RT-PCR testers for travelers. Residents of York Southwestern have alerted my office of travel PCR tests costs that far exceed the cost of many other countries around the world. There is no reason Ontario has such high lab test fees, and I'm left wondering if the reason is this government's continued push to weaken our health care through more and more privatization of services. Almost half of all lab testers performed in this province are done by private companies that are funded by the province. In fact, it is worth noting that the lobbyist for Switch Health, the company contracted to provide Pearson A poor testing is pharma communications director for the PC party. In the absence of competitive lab testing to ensure low prices, it is up to the government to set reasonable per test prices with costs such as high $250 per person. Something is very, very wrong, Mr. Speaker. Families traveling for funerals, weddings, or other purposes should not be taken advantage of. When COVID testers are covered by OHIP, why then are mandatory PCR testers for travel not regarded as the same? The health ministry needs to take action and take action immediately, and we need to stop, Mr. Speaker, the privatization of our public health care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. I recognize a member from Oakville, North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Just a few days ago, I joined the Hellenic Heritage Foundation to unva unveil a Heritage Toronto historical plaque at 170 Jarvis Street. 
I was pleased to bring greetings on behalf of the Premier and our government, along with Mayor John Tory. It's an important recognition in 2021, the year of Greece's bicentennial. 170 Jarvis Street played a key role in the history of the Greek community in Toronto. In 1912, Greek immigrants across Ontario raised money so the small community could purchase the building, paying it off in full in five short years in 1917. It was a haven for Greek immigrants arriving in Toronto, a place where they could share in the life of their community. The first floor became the first Greek Orthodox Church in Ontario. In 1921, the upper level of the building was used as a day school called Athena. This school taught English and Greek and eventually became an afternoon language school for more than 100 students. 170 Jarvis was the centre of the community where Greeks worshipped, socialised, married and learned in their own language. It will always be remembered as a place of learning and faith. Thank you to the Hellenic Heritage Foundation for your work to preserve and promote Hellenic culture and history in Ontario and to everyone who joined us for the unveiling. Thank you. Member Statements, I recognize the member from London North Centre. Speaker, we've all missed going to the movies with friends and supporting our local artists during the pandemic. That's why I was so excited to attend the very successful Forest City Film Festival, my riding of London North Centre. Forest City Film Fest is a jury competition for features, short films, documentaries, and animations. Bigger and better than ever, they screened more than 70 films and hosted various events, both online and in person. Thanks to their efforts, London was able to celebrate our tremendous local talent recognize local filmmakers, and foster future talent with the Ontario Screen Creators Conference. Forest City Film Festival is also doing its part to highlight voices traditionally marginalized in Ontario's arts industry. They partnered with the London Music Office to create a music video showcase highlighting musicians and bands from racialized backgrounds. This project not only showcases London's diversity, but highlights how London is a community where everyone's culture is welcomed and celebrated. London's art scene is also helping the city get back on its feet after the pandemic. London's film office has brought millions in investment to our city, in addition to entertaining us with great films and projects. The London Economic Development Corporation also welcomes filmmakers with London's film business concierge, at no cost, I should add, offering supports, incentives, and connections to our amazing local talent and crew. I look forward to all the future blockbuster productions for the big and small screen in Ontario's next Hollywood. London, Ontario. I encourage everyone to go to filmlondon.ca to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. I recognize the member from Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For 45 years, Care for Seniors and Community Services Association has been providing exceptional senior care across York Region, GTA, and especially in Scarborough. It was my pleasure this week to welcome our Minister of Finance, Peter Bethlen Felfi to Richmond Hill and to provide him with a tour of the site where CAFERS is building the Campus of Care. The new Campus of Care in Richmond Hill will feature a 120-bed long-term bed, 120-bed uh, long-term care home, a community hub with elderly persons center, a gym, a community kitchen, and a medical center with other that offer family medicine and specialized care to more than 10,000 patients each year. This exciting project is expected to complete in 2024. As seniors expected to reach 3 million by 2023 and aging at home is becoming the preference, it is important for us to make the necessary plans. The Care First Campus of Care will address these needs. Our seniors will connect with the community, have the health care and the activities they need, making friends with their neighbors while getting the medical advice and the care they need. Thank you, and we look forward to working with the community partners. 
Thank you. Member statements. I recognize the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This morning, I want to take the time to tell you about a, an event happening this Saturday by an amazing community organization, Wayside House of Hamilton. Wayside House provides 60 integrated residential addiction beds for men over 18. In the last year, they have served over 420 men with various programs with an 88 percent reconnection with family or close connections, as well as an 84 percent reduction in emergency room visits. They have provided trauma-informed male-specific care in Hamilton for over 54 years. This weekend is their third annual Step Up for Wayside fundraiser, a 5K walker run which is aimed at bringing awareness and also to support access for care. Our community in Hamilton has experienced significant loss these past two years during COVID-19 due to the overdose deaths, and it has had a significant impact on our community. Wayside House prides themselves on the fact that they have not had to close their doors since the pandemic started. They have ensured access is available to men across the province, and it is important that we recognize their efforts. Speaker, there needs to be more funding into mental health and addiction programs in this province so that organizations like Wayside House can continue to provide these necessary services to those who need it. I want to thank Wayside House for all the work that they are doing in our community, and I'm excited to take part in the Step Up for Wayside Walk this Saturday. Thank you. Member statements? Member statements, I recognize the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise to speak about an organization which is doing great work for many Ontarians. November is Diabetes Awareness Month, and November 14th is World Diabetes Day, a, a day recognized by the United Nations and celebrated globally. It is also the birthday of the celebrated Ontarian and Nobel laureate Sir Frederick Banting, who co-discovered and helped deliver the life-saving drug insulin to the world 100 years ago. To celebrate this momentous achievement in medical science, Diabetes Canada has launched its We Can't Wait Another 100 Years to End Diabetes Awareness Campaign. As Canada's leader in supporting Canadians with diabetes, Diabetes Canada is always very active during Diabetes Awareness Month with an urgent call to action. In Ontario, 4.4 million people have diabetes and prediabetes. Diabetes Awareness Month is a time to talk about the impact of the disease and how it affects a, a lot of people, 4.4 million people in Ontario, and those who love them. With this year being the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, it is important to seize this moment and to work to end diabetes once and for all so that the impacts of diabetes are not still being endured 100 years from today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. I recognize a member from Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. After 18 months of crawling through the pandemic, many had hoped that the Premier had finally started to learn some lessons. And after yesterday's announcement, it's clear that that's simply a pipe dream. The failed pandemic plan was on full display as the Premier pandered to anti-vaxxers while announcing health care workers would not be required to get vaccinated. The Premier claims that tens of thousands of health care workers would lose their jobs with a vaccine requirement, but the Health Minister has no information to back that up. In fact, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, which was one of the first hospitals to require vaccinations, has a vaccination rate of 99.7%. The Ottawa Hospital has a vaccination rate of 99%. At UHN here in Toronto, it's 98%. The largest hospitals in the province have proven that they can make vaccine requirements work. Of course, Mr. Speaker, this is nothing new. Hospital workers have been required to provide proof of any number of vaccinations for years. As the OMA said, Hospitals already require proof of vaccine immunity for 17 different conditions, including measles, rubella, varicella, and tuberculosis. It's COVID-19 should not be treated any differently, Mr. Speaker. Imagine if you're immunocompromised or awaiting a life-saving surgery at a hospital. Wouldn't you want your nurse or doctor to be vaccinated? Wouldn't you want to know or at least have a choice, Mr. Speaker? COVID-19 has shut down the planet and killed 5 million people over the last 18 months. Hospitals and healthcare facilities should be areas of relative safety and security, and patients shouldn't need to worry if their doctor or nurse is vaccinated. Thank you. That concludes time for member statements.